Silver Center for Constitutional Studies and Moral Leadership and an Associate Professor of Ethics and Constitutional Law. Welcome to Waynesburg University's Silver Lecture Series. Past speakers in this series have included a drug czar, John Walters, Harvard political science professor, Theda Scotchpaul, University of Pennsylvania law professor, David Skeel, Philadelphia judge, uh, Gary Glazer, Los Angeles police chief, former Los Angeles police chief, Robert Gordon, and Claremont McKenna professor, Charles Kessler. Tonight we welcome to this guest list, Professor Josh Blackman, Associate Professor of Law at South Texas College of Law in Houston, Texas. Professor Blackman is the author of the critically acclaimed and definitive text. Definitive, whoa. Oh, it is. Uh, uh, un unprecedented, the constitutional challenge to Obamacare. If you ever study that case, you have to read Professor Blackman's book, as well as Unrival Unraveled Obamacare Religious Liberty and Executive Power, published recently by Cambridge University Press. Along with Georgetown Law Professor Randy Barnett, who is also another friend of the Stover program, Professor Blackman is the co-author of Constitutional Law Cases and Context, the third edition, published by Walters Kluwer. And as an aside, this is the text we use in POL 306, American is it? Constitutional Law. Of you course. Book? We, we do. Uh, and, um, royalties, thank you all much. Um, one, we, we do, and um, there's still openings next semester, so you can join us for that course. Um, Professor Blackman, clerk for the Honorable Danny Boggs, on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. So was that was to the west in Ohio, right? Uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, Kentucky, okay, somewhere out there. And, and, uh, and for the Honorable Kim Gibson of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. So that's where we live. Johnstown. Johnstown. Any, someone, we have some Johnstown people here. Yes. Um, and he's a graduate of George Mason University School of Law. Uh, he is the author of over three dozen law review articles including, and I say this, an aptly titled article, Gridlock and Congressional Power, in the November 2016 Harvard Law Review. And besides having his own legal blog, which is the best legal blog out there because it was the first legal blog to publicize, publicize the Stover Center's Constitution Day play. True, true. He, he publicized Bread Bakers and Co the Constitution about the Lochner case a few years ago, and he's done it ever since. Um, he frequently writes for the Volek Conspiracy SCOTUS blog, as well as publishing articles in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and USA Today. So he stays up all of his hours writing. He was selected by Forbes magazine for the 30 Under 30 in Law and Public Policy. And this is what's really exciting. This past Saturday at a dinner in Washington, D.C., uh, immediately prior to a speech by one Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, Professor Blackman was awarded, the Federalist Society awarded him the Joseph Story Award for a young academic under 40 who has demonstrated excellence in legal scholarship, a commitment to teaching, a concern for students, and who has made a significant public impact in a manner that advances the rule of law in a free society. And upon receiving the award, Professor Blackman posited that he's something of a slacker. And everyone said, what? Uh, and he said, compared to the prize's namesake, Justice Story had already been, at that age, appointed to the Supreme Court by President Madison. So, um, but anyway, uh, his CV attests to the fact that he is no slacker. And let us give an enthusiastic welcome to Waynesburg University to Professor Block. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you are all so fortunate Professor Stratton is a gem. Uh, I have looked over your curriculum and what he's teaching you, and I can tell you there are not many colleges in the United States that give you what you're getting here, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the president and Professor Stratton, everyone else here in attendance. Uh, this is actually a, a home for me. I lived in Johnstown for two years. I'm a Penn State alum, uh, so I spent a good chunk of my formative career in Western Pennsylvania. Oh, State College is somewhere in the middle, so you know, but, but I lived on the west side of African Street, so basically the west side of, uh, uh, of Pennsylvania, and I'm very grateful to be back here. Um, my topic tonight focuses on something you may have studied but never considered in a coherent sense, which is how criminal law intersects with the Constitution, and specifically the protection of economic liberty under the Constitution. And we have to look at this question from two perspectives. 
how federal laws constrain economic liberty and how state criminal laws constrain economic liberty. And they're very different questions because as we've studied, the powers of the state government are very different from the powers of the federal government. So as you know, under the Constitution, the bulk of what Congress can do is swept under what's called the Commerce Clause, which gives Congress the power to regulate commerce among the states. But the states don't need any grant of authority. They have their own what's called police power, the ability to regulate the health, safety, and welfare of their people. And this is a power they had from independence. When Pennsylvania declared independence in 1776, whatever powers the king had devolved onto Pennsylvania. So my talk tonight will I try to answer one question. When you're reviewing legislation that touches on the right to an honest living, economic liberty, and that law is of a criminal nature, not a civil nature, should courts interact with it differently? That is, if I file a civil challenge to some law that limits my right to own a business, should there be a different standard if the state comes after me and charges me with a crime which I can actually face jail time for? To state it more simply, are criminal laws different for purposes of economic liberty? And what you'll find is that some of the most important economic liberty cases that have come before the Supreme Court are criminal in nature. So on the federal side, I found at least six that I'm going to talk about today. The first is called United States versus DeWitt from 1869. You've never heard of it, it's a big case. The civil rights cases from 1883, which you may have studied. Champion versus Ames, also called the lottery ticket case from 1903. ALA Schechter Poultry versus the United States from 1935. United States versus Carolyn Products, I'm sure you learned about, from 1938 and United States versus Darby in 1941. Those are the federal cases I will talk about tonight. On the state side, there are also a number of cases, one of which, Yikwo versus Hopkins, which I'm sure you learned about, from 1886. The second one, the subject of your musical, Lochner versus the people of New York, 1905. That one's Lochner versus New York. No, no, no. It's versus the people of New York. It was a criminal case. People forget that part. Lochner's looking at jail time. Then you have a case called Muller versus Oregon, 1908, also criminal. Berea College versus Kentucky, which is one that's probably very near and dear to this, this university from 1908 as well. Meyer versus Nebraska, good Germanic school, right? Uh, 1923. And the last one will be Nebbia versus New York, actually versus the people of New York, to be precise in my own terminology, uh, 1934. So those are the cases I want to talk about tonight. Should the courts have approached economic liberty differently in those cases because the penalty at issue was criminal in nature? So the first question we have to ask ourselves, we start from first principles, does the federal constitution even permit Congress to create crimes? Right, we know states can create crimes, they have a police power, but does Congress even have the power? And I think the answer is probably yes, but there was some doubt. At the time of the ratification process, you had the Federalists, you had the Anti-Federalists. And one of the more prominent Anti-Federalists was Brutus. That was a pseudonym, not his real name, but he went by Brutus. And he wrote, quote, there is no criminal matter to which the judicial power of the United States will extend, but such as are included under some one of the cases specified in this section. So Brutus recognized early on that Congress's powers to define crimes are fairly narrow. Indeed, Article 3, Section 2 says the trial of all crimes shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in a state where the said crime has been committed. So the Constitution, by its text, countenances federal crime. So we can at least agree that there is idea of a federal crime under the original Constitution. Um, recently, the Supreme Court addressed this issue in a case called United States versus Comstock, 2010. <clears throat> and the Justice, uh, Justice Breyer of the majority opinion, and he said, the Constitution, which nowhere speaks explicitly about the creation of federal crimes beyond those related to counterfeiting, treason, or piracies committed on the high seas, 
nonetheless grants Congress broad power to create such crimes. And he cites McCulloch v. Maryland, which says, all admit that the government may legitimately punish any violation of its laws. And yet, this is not among the enumerated powers of Congress. So it's long been understood that Congress can define crimes, and Congress can also specify what the punishment are for those crimes. And Congress routinely enacts such laws with respect to the power to regulate commerce, enforce civil rights, spend funds for the general welfare, establish uh, uh, federal courts, establish post offices, and regulate bankruptcy, and, and so on. Um, Justice Alito elaborated, elaborated on this in his concurring opinion. He said, most federal criminal statutes rest upon a congressional judgment that in order to execute one or more of the powers conferred by Congress, it is necessary and proper to criminalize certain conduct. And in order to do that, it's obviously necessary and proper to provide for the operation of the federal criminal justice system and a federal prison system. So I'll give you an easy example. The Constitution gives Congress the power to punish counterfeiting. So what if someone counterfeits money? I think, I think people would agree that they can take a statute saying that's a crime. And if you counterfeit money, we'll put you in a federal prison. So even though there's no express power to create a federal prison, as a necessary and proper means of accomplishing that enumerated power, that's a punishment of counterfeiting, you can then punish someone for doing that in a federal prison of some sort. Okay? So you have the enumerated powers. But what happens when you're criminalizing stuff that perhaps goes beyond the enumerated powers? We all know Congress can't exceed its enumerated powers. So if you're charged with a crime, and the crime is that you're violating the law, your defense is, you can't prosecute me for doing this. Why? Because Congress lacks the power to do this. And I want to start walking you through some cases, a lot of cases today, some of which you've never heard of. But one of the first major Commerce Clause challenges you've never heard of. Actually, if you use our casebook, you've heard of it. But most people have never heard of it. A case called United States versus DeWitt, 1869. Oh, you've never heard of this case, but it's important. This law was enacted in 1869, and it made it a crime to sell certain oils, used to burn oil, make light. It made it a crime to sell certain types of oil. And the punishment for violating this offense was a fine of not less than $100, and by imprisonment of a term of not less than six months or more than three years. So this may see a mandatory minimum jail sentence for selling oil for a term of not less than six months. So there was a guy, Mr. DeWitt, who was indicted that is charged with defense of selling petroleum oil in Detroit. This is a very early application of what we call economic liberty. He was engaged in a lawful profession and trying to sell oil to someone else who wanted to buy it. Supply and demand, pretty easy stuff here, right? He defended himself, not by denying the charges, he admitted he sold the oil. There's no, no dispute of fact. But instead, he said, Congress can't criminalize this because you're regulating a local transaction. The sale of oil in Detroit is not interstate commerce, he argued. It's a local action which is subject to the police power. And this is what the Tenth Amendment suggests, that if a power is not delegated to the federal government, it's reserved to the states. Congress can't ban the local sale of oil. Therefore, it's for the states to ban the local sale of oil. Michigan did not ban the sale of oil. Therefore, this action was beyond the scope of federal power. And in a decision by Chief Justice Chase, the court ruled that indeed, DeWitt could not be prosecuted for the sale of oil because this was not interstate commerce, that it was too remote from any sort of economic activity crossing state lines. The mere fact that the sale of this oil 
might affect oil sales in another state was too remote, at least in 1869. And the court said that Congress has no police powers within state limits. So this was a fairly early decision, 1869, shortly after the Civil War, that recognized that there are limits on the federal government's power to regulate economic activity and economic liberty. The next case I want to bring up is one you might be familiar with, but probably never thought of it this way. In 1875, Congress enacted a Civil Rights Act. It was a very important piece of legislation. And it provided that private businesses could not discriminate on the basis of race or color with respect to certain common carriers. These are uh, hotels, theaters, inns, restaurants, etc. Now, what was the penalty for turning away people from your business on the basis of race? It was a crime. It wasn't merely a civil offense. There was a misdemeanor, a fine of not less than $500 or more than $1,000. And they can be imprisoned not less than 30 days. So imagine in 1875, Congress passed a major statute that said, if a business turns away a customer based on their skin color, the business owner can go to jail for up to a month, I'm sorry, as little as a month or up to a year. That was a pretty big act. And indeed, after this law was enacted, a number of businesses in New York, in California, not just the South, by the way, in New York, California, Missouri, all over the United States were charged with excluding African-American patrons from their businesses. They were excluded. They faced criminal sanctions, criminal indictments for turning away black customers. Now, what the Supreme Court did in this case, though, is they actually upheld the economic liberty of the business owners. Wait a minute, what, Josh, what did you say? The court struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875 holding that Congress lacked the power to regulate private businesses. The court said that Congress can only regulate state action, that is, with the actions taken by the government. Private businesses were beyond the scope. In other words, free enterprise, if a business wants to be racist, that is not Congress's business. It's the business of the state. And if the state doesn't want to ban segregation in businesses, they don't have to. This is a similar idea to DeWitt. You may like the idea of selling oil, but you may not like the idea of being businesses segregated. But here, the court said we're not going to interpose because Congress can't touch this local activity. So you have these four cases where business owners want to turn away black customers. The U.S. government wants to put them in jail for doing so. And the Supreme Court invalidated the Civil Rights Act holding that Congress can't regulate this local activity. This was a very big decision. As a consequence of this, segregation in the South became rampant. Jim Crow bloomed, blossomed, because of this sort of decision. And it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, nearly 100 years later, that Congress took another attempt at eradicating segregation in places of public accommodation. But instead of relying on the 14th Amendment, they turned to our familiar Commerce Clause. The primitive. We'll get there a little bit later. The next case I want to talk about is Champion versus Ames. This case you may have studied. It's often called the lottery ticket case. Today, the government has lottery tickets. Go to near a Sheets. I love Sheets, by the way. My favorite store in the world. And whenever I come here, I stop at Sheets. I was a little bit late. I stopped at a Sheets in West Virginia. Uh, but I love, I love Sheets. Best store in the world. Uh, you get Sheets nearby in town? Yes, we do. Ah, boy. There we go. So, you know, today you go to the local Sheets, whatever, and you buy a lottery ticket, no problem. The, the government sells it. Okay? But back in the 1800s, uh, lottery tickets were deemed sinful, immoral. It was a form of gambling. And the federal government tried to prohibit the sale of lottery tickets. Now, they weren't American lottery tickets. They were foreign lottery tickets, actually from Panama. I'm sorry, it was from Paraguay, I'm sorry. 
And the statute says that any person who brings a lottery ticket into the United States for sale shall be punishable for no more than two years or by fine of not more than $1,000 or both. So again, you have someone who wants to sell lottery tickets, right? It's a business, making money, right? You're, 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 you're gambling. And Congress tried to criminalize that. Now, if the state wants to ban lottery tickets, they can. But we all know with 50, well, we weren't 50 back then, but now there are 50 states, each state can have a different policy. Maybe Ohio wants tickets and Pennsylvania doesn't. But when Congress bans them, it's a uniform, one-size-fits-all solution. There's no experimentation. There's no laboratory democracy, so to speak. The court upheld this statute. And this is an opinion by Justice John Marshall Harlan, an icon of mine. Um, and the court held that the transportation of lottery tickets is itself commerce. And this was the start of the broadening of the Commerce Clause by reading more broadly that commerce includes carrying these articles from one state to another. But Justice Harlan went a little bit beyond that. He also held that Congress has the power to prevent immoral conduct, that lottery tickets were, quote, injurious to the public morals, and that Congress had the power to stop that from happening. So this was a foothold, if you will, to the fact that the federal government can have something approaching a police power to even go after private businesses who are not engaging in any sort of commerce between the states. Let's fast forward about three decades to another case called ALA Schechter Poultry Corporation versus United States. This was a very famous decision decided at the height of the New Deal. It's called Schechter Poultry, but the nickname is the Sick Chicken Case. Um, during the New Deal, Congress enacted something called the NIRA, the National Industrial Recovery Act. In fact, there, there's, there was called the NRA, not, not our NRA, but you know, the, the national, it was a National Industrial Recovery Act, and their, their symbol is a blue eagle. You know, these businesses, there's a blue eagle in their window. And this law, allowed the president to approve codes of fair competition. Again, it wasn't Congress creating these codes of competition, it was the president. Basically, Congress was giving the president the power to write laws. You've all seen Squirrel's Rocks. That's not how it works. Congress writes the laws, not the president. And in this case, the president wrote a series of codes for the sale of poultry in New York City. One of the rules was that the poultry had to be sold without discrimination, that whatever chicken was given to you, you had to take. Right? There's, there's one, 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 one of the rules. Um, there was a problem with this rule, though. Um, under the rules of kosher, the Jewish faith, uh, you can't eat a sick chicken. It's prohibited. If the animal is sick, you just can't eat it. So there were a number of kosher butchers in New York who would not comply with this regime because it was against their religious beliefs. Now, we didn't have much of a free exercise clause back then. They simply said, we're not going to follow this rule. What did the Roosevelt administration do? They charged them with federal crimes. They indicted them. The statute allowed a fine of not more than $500 for each offense. And it's a misdemeanor. And by the way, each offense is each chicken that's sold not in accordance with the rules. So it would basically put them out of business. So again, you had a criminal prosecution against a couple kosher butchers that were the Schechter brothers. By the way, in Yiddish, which is a Jewish Germanic language, the word Schecht means to slaughter. So their last name Schechter actually meant to slaughter. It was a very appropriate name. So the Schechter brothers refused to comply with this ordinance, and they were prosecuted. Their case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually ruled against President Roosevelt and in favor of the butchers. The court ruled that this statute was unconstitutional, that Congress cannot delegate such broad authority to the president to make criminal codes. 
that it's beyond the president's power to create crimes. So at least here, there's some recognition of a limitation on Congress and the president's ability to restrict this, this economic liberty. But my friends, Schechter poultry is probably not good law. Um, 1935 was a good year for the Constitution. It went downhill after that. Uh, in the very famous year of 1936, um, in a series of decisions, the court changed pace. And they started deferring to the Roosevelt administration and granting greater deference to federal power. And after 1936, all bets were off. And the court looked the other way as Congress and the president regulated all manner of economic liberty. Um, and that was basically the last year there was any meaningful judicial resistance, if you will, to uh, a federal power over economic freedom. The important case, which I want to talk about probably for longer than the other cases, is United States versus Carolyn Products, 1938. Very, very important case. So have you all had condensed milk? You know what that is? A like carnation, right? You have it in a can. It sits in your shelf forever. Um, condensed milk was a wonderful product in the 1930s for those who did not have refrigeration, right? If you don't have refrigeration, you can't keep fresh milk. It'll go bad. But condensed milk works because you remove the dairy and you replace it with vegetable oil. So it sits on the shelf, it sits there, it's fine. I mean, I don't like it very much, but it, people like it, right? It's very sweet. So there was a brand of condensed milk called Milnut, M-I-L-N-U-T, Milnut. And it was made by a company called Caroline Products. They were based in Litchfield, Illinois, but their facilities all over the Midwest. Who did not like filled milk? The farmers, right? Dairy producers hated this because it put them out of business. Who would need to go get fresh milk if you can just buy a can on the shelf and let it sit there for a few months? So what did good dairy farmers do? Do they compete, make a better product? Of course not. They lobbied for legislation criminalizing the sale of filled milk. And in state after state, criminal laws were passed making a crime to sell condensed milk. It was a crime, not a civil offense, it was a crime. And then they hit the big load. They got Congress to ban the sale of filled milk in 1923. It was a criminal offense to ship filled milk in interstate commerce. They said it was an adulterated article of food injurious to public health. Focus. It was perfectly healthy. In fact, we know now that filled milk is healthier than real milk because it doesn't have the cholesterol. It's actually better for you. Anyway, maybe not, I don't know. But the, the argument that it was, it was uh, uh, injurious to public health was simply never true. In fact, a really funny story. You know what else dairy farmers hated? Margarine, right? What's margarine? It's a vegetable oil-based butter substitute, right? You don't need to refrigerate it. It sits on your shelf, right? Laws were actually passed, this is crazy, to discourage the sale of margarine. States said it had to be dyed pink, right? That you couldn't make margarine white, yellow, because it looks too much like butter, people get confused. That's a dye of pink. Who's going to put pink spread on a bagel? No, no one. Anyway. So this was a criminal case. Now, the Caroline Products Company was indicted and charged with selling this filled milk. And the case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the final decision was actually a four to three vote. Due to the various recusals and absences, there's only a seven-member court. So it's not clear, at least to me, there was a majority opinion. But it was a four to three decision. But the court ruled against Caroline Products and upheld the conviction. And they have this famous footnote, very famous footnote. If you guys go to law school, which I encourage you to think about, the most famous footnote in Supreme Court history is footnote four of Caroline Products. And Justice Stone put out this framework of how to think about economic rights. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, unless a right is clearly listed in the Constitution, let the democratic process take care of it. That if it's on the face of the Bill of Rights, the courts give it some scrutiny. If a law impacts so-called discrete and insular minorities or affects the political process, the courts can look at it more carefully. But this is some sort of unenumerated right. <coughs> courts should back off. Economic liberty, my friends, is not really written down anywhere in the Constitution. 
So Caroline products set the rule that from this point forward, when you have a law, the claim is a, a right of contract or property, the court should simply look the other way. Um, this case, though, is absolutely remarkable. Okay? I want to tell you the story of what came after Caroline products. I know this because I talked to uh, Charles Hauser's grandchildren. The grandkids are still alive. This is a great story. So Charles Hauser, who was the president of Caroline Products, did not accept the Supreme Court's decision as a final word. He said, after weighing the risks carefully, he decided to tangle with the law. And he began to test the filled milk product. He knew he was right. So despite the federal ban and the Supreme Court decision, he continued to ship milk in a slightly different formulation in interstate commerce. Eventually, the law caught up with him. In 1941, Hauser and his assistant were indicted on eight counts of shipping 300,000 cans of filled milk from Indiana to West Virginia. Now, Hauser's granddaughter, Donna Satley, told me a story. I don't think it's true, but this is the family story. The story goes that Charles Hauser personally drove the truck across the West Virginia border. I could find no evidence of that, but that's a family story. Hauser's grandson recounted that they selected West Virginia because they thought it was a friendly forum. Nope. So before driving across the border, Hauser asked his lawyers if there was any chance he could receive jail time for driving a milk truck. His lawyers blew him off, said, made a joke, no, no way, you're not going to jail. Unfortunately, they selected the wrong forum. The judge who arraigned Charles Hauser would not set bail and remanded him to custody of the marshal for driving a milk truck. Now, the marshal didn't want to put him in jail, so he hosted Hauser as a house guest, but nevertheless restricted his liberty. Ultimately, the lawyers apologized for laughing about the possibility of jail time. Now, in his defense, Hauser said this Phil Milk Act did not apply to his new formulation. He also said the Phil Milk Act was unconstitutional. So the trial court, the district court, ruled against him, signed the Supreme Court decision, and they found the Phil Milk Act prohibits his actions. Both Hauser and his assistant were convicted, and they were sentenced to one year in prison, a full year in prison for driving a milk truck. The Court of Appeals affirmed, and they went back to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took his case a second time, and a second time they ruled against Hauser. The court unanimously upheld the conviction. What happens next is crazy. I don't think analysts do this, so I made it public. After the Supreme Court decision, Hauser was ready to report to Fort Leavenworth, which is in Kansas, a federal prison. But he never spent any time in jail. Hauser's lawyers appealed to President Roosevelt for a pardon. It was granted. FDR got a pardon. The assistant didn't get anything. He was screwed. But Roosevelt commuted the sentence for some of the counts, but not all of them. And the Attorney General signed off on it. For reasons I don't know, Roosevelt gave a pardon to the guy who was a thorn in his side, challenging his New Deal program. Apparently, House's grandson said the family was shocked. He said, quote, we were Republicans, right? <laughs> Roosevelt was a Democrat. So as a testament to what House of the conviction, he hung, this is serious, he hung his pardon papers on the wall of the bathroom of the Antler Club in Litchfield, Illinois. Kind of like the toilet paper in your bathroom, right? Basically like, like that. Even more remarkable is the time of these events. Uh, the case was argued October 16th of 44 and decided a few weeks later. Two months after that, on January 8th, Roosevelt signed the party. Three months later, Roosevelt died. I think this was one of the last pardon requests Roosevelt had ever signed before he died. Now it gets better. So you're Hauser, right? You just got out of jail. Can you find a different line of work? Nope. Here's what he did. He built a factory on the Oklahoma-Missouri border. The factory was half on the Oklahoma side and half on the Missouri side. There were truck doors on both sides of the factory. So he would have a brass rail down the middle of the factory, and the milk was never allowed to cross that line. 
Once the, the filled milk was made, it could not cross that line. And he had loading docks on both sides of the factory, and he shipped them out. So there's no interstate commerce. Unfortunately, that factory is shutting down. It's actually going to business this year. I hope to visit at some point, but I have pictures if you want to see. I'll show you later. Uh, but I talked to a guy named uh, a, a Wayne King. He worked at the factory for almost five decades. And he told me that no employee would ever cross the line. You had the employees on Oklahoma side, <laughs> and you had the employees on the Missouri side. They knew. Um, as a testament, in 1972, a federal court actually struck down the filled milk ban finding it lacked even a rational basis. So, happy ending. Hauser didn't live long enough to see it, but his factory went on for decades. And I actually have a can of Caroline Potts Mill Nut back in my office. Never tried it. I don't really like it. Um, and the last case I want to talk about is called United States versus Darby. And this concerned whether Congress had the power to criminalize the shipment of lumber if the workers were not paid the minimum wage. And again, under this federal law, anyone who ships lumber that was made by substandard wages, workers, was guilty of a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment for not more than six months. So if you employ people and you didn't pay them minimum wage and they ship lumber, you go to jail for up to six months. Now, there is no question that the shipment of the goods was in interstate commerce, but Congress is regulating the manufacture. That is, where the payment of the wages to local workers was that interstate commerce is an economic activity. And the court basically said, yeah, it is. That because this local activity has an effect on interstate commerce, that is, if we're paying workers in Pennsylvania a low wage, Pennsylvania's in, I'm sorry, workers in other state may get more benefits. So here the courts start to signal that even if we're dealing with local actions, they can have a broader effect on commerce in other states, and therefore Congress can regulate it and criminalize it. Okay? So let me synthesize a bit, right? As a general matter, the courts are very deferential to the Commerce Clause, right? If there's an exercise of federal power, courts generally uphold it. I submit that when you're dealing with criminal law, when you're looking to throw a guy in jail for driving a milk truck, or throw a guy in jail for selling oil, or throw a guy in jail for selling lottery tickets, there should be a higher standard of review with respect to the Commerce Clause. To put this in terms of scrutiny, which you've studied, this is not merely an act of what has a rational basis, but is there something more compelling? That if the government has one interest to regulate the economy, the interest in criminalizing that should be even greater. And I hope to write about that at some point. So that's federal. Uh, let's move on to the state prosecution. Um, before the ratification of the 14th Amendment, the states had a very broad police power. In fact, this is what enabled slavery. That was up to the states to decide whether or not to commit slavery as a positive institution. That changed after the Civil War with Reconstruction. The 13th Amendment eradicated slavery. The 14th Amendment said that states cannot deprive a person of their life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and Congress the power to enforce that provision. But did the 14th Amendment affect economic liberty? So there's one case I'll mention briefly that's not a criminal case that's relevant, is the slaughterhouse cases. This is a case from Louisiana, where New Orleans created a monopoly. What's that? If you want a butcher to slaughter an animal in New Orleans, you can no longer do it at your own shop. You'd have to bring it to a centralized location. Say, oh, Josh, what's the big deal? You couldn't have your own slaughter shop. The butcher said this violates our economic liberty. It violates what's known as the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled against the butcher, said, no, no, no. This word privileges or immunities refers to a fairly small set of federal rights. Doesn't, doesn't work. Okay. So that's the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Uh, the remainder of my talk is on the Due Process Clause, which again says you can't, so the state cannot deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the first case I want to talk about, you've probably heard of, 
but never thought of as a criminal law matter, which is Yikwo over Hopkins. If you're interested, I did a special on C-SPAN on that case earlier this week. It's on YouTube. You can go watch it. So San Francisco enacted the law that said if you want to run a laundry in a wooden building, you have to apply for a permit. Okay. What were the standards for granting a permit? There were no standards. You didn't have to say your place was safe. You didn't have to show that the equipment was in good shape. You had to just apply for a permit. It was completely random arbitrary. It was up to the sheriff to decide whether you got a permit with no rational basis at all. As it turned out, all of the Chinese people who applied for permits were denied. And all but one of the white people who applied were given permits. So a lot of people view this as a protection case, that it was a violation of racial discrimination. Um, that, I think, is a postmodern approach to the case. The court's decision was actually based on due process. So what happened? Mr. Li Yik, by the way, his name was not Yik Wo. Yik Wo was the name of the laundromat. His name was Li Yik. He was fined $10 for violating the ordinance. That was a lot of money back then for an immigrant launderer. He refused to pay it. He was imprisoned for default. He was sent to jail for running a laundry shop. That was perfectly lawful, it was inspected, everything was fine. He then sued that what's called a writ of habeas corpus, asking the court to let him go. The California Supreme Court ruled against him, said, no, 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 the state can do this within the police power. The Supreme Court reversed. The Supreme Court reversed. Now, again, a lot of people think the Supreme Court reversed because, ah, oh, it's racial discrimination against Chinese people. Not so fast. What the court actually says is that it's a violation of due process of law. That is, there's a liberty interest, a property interest that's being deprived with no standard, no fairness. That one guy gets a permit, the other guy gets denied with no basis. And this is, I think, how you have to look at Yik Wo. This is, I think, the beginning of what we would come to know as the Lochner era. It, doesn't, it was, came a little bit later, but it was an early entry. The idea is if you want to infringe on someone's liberty interest, the right to earn a living, you have to have a good reason. And you can't do it in an arbitrary fashion. The court let Li Yik, Yik Wo, go free, and they made some good statements of equal protection. But the reason why I don't see this as really a, a racial equality case is a couple years later they decided Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld a separate but equal doctrine. How can it be that you can have no racial discrimination against Chinese people, but you can have plenty of separate equal for people of African descent? They don't, they don't fit that way. Same court. So I think you have to read Yik Wo as a case concerning economic liberty. And it was a criminal case that the court struck down. Okay? The next case, which I know you're familiar with, Lochner versus the people of New York, 1905. And by the way, with the exception of very few people, when you say Lochner, they get very scared. They, they, they kind of close up and they, they say, oh my god, Lochner's evil is the worst thing in the world. It's not that bad. I think it was wrongly decided, but it's not the end of the world. In this case, if a baker worked more than 80 hours a week, right? If a baker employed, sorry, if a baker employed someone who worked more than 80 hours a week, it was a crime. They could be sentenced to a fine of $50, and if they don't pay it, they can be in jail for up to 50 days, right? So if you employ a baker who wants to work 80 hours a week, and he works that many, you get sent to jail, even if you pay a fair wage. Now, when you're all lawyers, you will laugh at an 80 hour work week. That's a piece of cake, you're just standing on your head. But this was a crime. Now, why was this law enacted? Um, part of it was to protect workers, no doubt. Baking is very stressful, very dangerous work. You're inhaling all these particles. But there was another motivation here for this law. Um, most of the bake shops at the time were run by immigrants. And because you needed a very big oven, they were often in the basement of buildings, right? You couldn't have it on the second floor, thing would fall through the roof. Um, this was a law of protectionism. It was designed to put small, independent, mostly immigrant bakers out of business. So that way the bigger bakers could stay open, right? If you're a small baker and you're an immigrant, what you're gonna do? You're gonna make the bread, make the dough, has to rise, go sleep for an hour. When it rises, you need it. Okay, go take another nap. Put it in the oven, 
take another nap, right? It was a 24-hour process. And if you're fighting for your life, you do this. If you have a big bake shop, you have different shifts coming in. So this law was a cost that could be incurred by the bigger bakeries, but not by the small bakeries. This is a common misconception. They think, oh, corporations hate regulation. No, 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 no. Big corporations love regulation because they can afford to pay for it. They can, they can shoulder the cost. Small businesses can't because they can't afford to deal with all these layers of, uh, of bureaucracy. So you have Mr. Joseph Lochner. Okay? He employed a worker, Amit Schmitter, more than 80 hours a week. By the way, this is a test case. What does that mean? They deliberately tried to break the law to violate it. Okay? So this was deliberate. And he was actually convicted. Again, it was Lochner versus the people of New York. Not just New York, the people. This is a criminal matter. This case went to the Supreme Court, and he raised that there's a right of economic liberty, a right of contract at issue. In a very famous, or depending who asked, infamous case, five to four, the court split and ruled that, in fact, there was an economic liberty right to work as many hours as you wanted. If you want to work 80 hours, you can't. It cannot be a crime. Very famous dissent by Justice Holmes, who said the Constitution does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics, right? That the Constitution does not enact any particular theory of economic uh, uh, libertarianism, if you will. Herbert Spencer was a very famous uh, philosopher of the day. He sure studied Spencer at some point. He had a good program. Uh, but Lochner is today reviled. And it's looked upon as what the courts should not do. They should not assess the wisdom of legislation. And in the post caroline products world, Lochner is discarded. Okay? The next case I want to talk about is Muller versus Oregon, 1908. It's a little bit different. Now, this wasn't a law restricting bakers. It was a law that said women can't work more than 10 hours a day. Hmm. Now, law seems to have a difficulty with women. Why can men work more than 10 hours a day, but women cannot? Well, it was based on a stereotype that women should be in the home. They shouldn't be working this many days. In fact, there was a very famous brief submitted to this case by, by Louis Brandeis, the famous Brandeis brief. It was filled with junk science. And it actually argued, I'm not making this up, that if a woman works too hard, her uterus can fall out. This was a science, right? They said that women, their blood can't handle this stress. So the question was, did women have the same sort of economic liberty interest? Did they have the same sort of economic liberty interest as did men? And the court ruled in favor of Oregon. They upheld the conviction. This is a law that fined someone $10 for employing women for more than 10 hours a day. And they said that the structural difference between men and women justified this disparate treatment. So again, in Lochner, only a couple years earlier, the court upheld the right of a man to work 80 hours a week, but years later, they said that the women lacked the corollary right. Okay, so that's Muller Oregon, 1908. Another case in 1908, which you may have never heard of, is Berea College versus Kentucky. A very important case but you've never heard of. Kentucky made it a crime to teach black and white students at the same college. A crime, a criminal conviction of $1,000 on the university if you teach people of different races the same institution. Big deal, right? The court actually ruled, right, in a very bizarre, circuitous way that this was valid. The court upheld this criminal law in a very strange way, which I don't have time to get into. But here you have a school, a university that wants to provide a certain product, integrated education, a good product to offer. And the state criminalized that offering of education. Justice Harlan, who's from Kentucky, dissented, wrote a very vigorous dissent, saying that this cannot be, that even though you have a corporation, a university, they still have economic rights. 
So if you say corporations have no rights, you're actually with majority in this one. So as Justice Harlan's dissent says, the corporation, the university, has constitutional rights to teach as they see fit. Okay, two more cases, I'm almost done, I promise. The next case is called Meyer versus Nebraska. Believe it or not, this law criminalized the teaching of any language other than English in public schools. That if you were a German teacher in a primary school, you could be fined $25 or be put in county jail for a month. Now, why was this law enacted? During World War II, there was a very strong anti-German bias in the United States. Very strong. People don't remember this. And in Nebraska, which is a high Germanic population, they were worried of kids not being American enough. As they were learning this foreign language, they have to, you know, make America great again and learn English, right? <laughs> Good election you guys. I didn't realize where I was until I saw the signs on the side of the road. So in Meyer v. Nebraska, there was actually a prosecution for teaching a foreign language. And the court actually ruled in favor of the teacher. And they said there's a, there's a liberty interest, an economic liberty interest in teaching that you cannot criminalize this act. There's also a related economic right, I'm sorry, a related right to raise your family as you see fit. And this was a liberty interest protected by the due process clause. Um, Meyer v. Nebraska is still cited today, if I think correctly. Uh, very often it's cited as a case about uh, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of speech. It wasn't. This was a due process case. The last case I want to talk about is from 1935, sorry, 1934, uh, Nebbia versus the people of New York. And this case involved a New York grocery store owner. Um, New York put a limit on the price of milk. They said a quart of milk can only cost nine cents. So you want to buy a quart of milk, you have to pay nine cents. Nebbia at a grocery store in New York says, aha, I have an idea. I'll sell you two quarts of milk and a loaf of bread for 18 cents, right? So basically you buy the two quarts of milk, you get the bread for free. Let's try to get around it. What they do, they charge with, with a state crime. And he is liable for up to a year in prison for selling milk. There was no allegation that milk was unsafe or anything else, but he was charged with this crime. The Supreme Court upheld this, and it says within the state's police power to regulate the price of milk, protect the dairy farmers. This was very consistent with the Caroline Products case. So let me synthesize a little bit here. When the state's police power is trying to regulate the health and safety of the people, uh, courts generally apply under Caroline products a very deferential standard of review, right? Almost what's called a rational basis that there's some conceivable reason why the statute should be upheld, it is upheld. Um, but I would submit that when you're throwing a person in jail for selling milk, baking bread, teaching black and white students in the same classroom, running a laundry shop, that's safe, that there should be some greater burden on the state to show that their basis is, in fact, more than rational, but justified. Um, it's easy enough to regulate someone. When you're willing to throw them in jail for up to a year, selling a loaf of bread with two quarts of milk, um, that's right for something beyond the state's police power. Uh, I'll stop here, and I welcome your questions as long as you have it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Black, where do you see um, the sorts of legislation headed now in the era of the internet where e-commerce means a lot more than going beyond state lines? A very good question. So how do we understand interstate commerce um, when the internet is global and there are no limits on commerce? Um, I think fortunately or unfortunately, this was settled about 80 years ago. Um, the definition of commerce had a meaning at the time of the ratification of the Constitution. It meant the exchange of goods. Commerce was distinguished from manufacture. It was distinguished from agriculture. These were different terms. 
Um, and the DeWitt case, the oil case I mentioned, embraces this. But starting in the 1900s with a lottery ticket case, the court starts saying commerce isn't merely the exchange of goods, but it means economic activity. And from there, they went in cases like Darby and Wicker v. Filburn. That's not only economic activity, but activity that can have an effect on economic activity, right? That if you're doing something that has some sort of effect on economic activity, that can also be regulated. Um, the court has not imposed any meaningful limits on how broad economic activity is. So my short answer to the question is, um, there's very little difference in what the states can do and what the federal government can do. But don't forget the 10th Amendment. If the states, I'm sorry, if the federal government can do it, that means the states can't do it. It's one or the other. They can't have it both ways. So as the sphere of federal power increases, the sphere of state power contracts. And that's an inescapable consequence of moving from commerce to economic activity to substantial effect in economic activity. That, that, that's the progression. So short answer is this was decided long before the internet. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, ma'am? Yeah. Well, I think the Nebia case I mentioned, the last one, where they threw a guy in jail basically for selling milk at a too cheap of a price. Once you uphold that conviction, then they can regulate the size of soda, and they can regulate the size of your styrofoam container and everything else. Um, in fact, the, the soda one is actually, uh, I remember reading about this case a couple of years ago. Um, the law they drafted was very vague and nebulous. So one of, the, one of the few ways you can challenge these laws is if it's too vague, that if you don't know what the, what the restriction is upon you, of course, you'll hold it. But so long as a statute's drafted with enough specificity, uh, the courts are not any longer in the business of restricting laws that touch an economic liberty. So New York City will make your soda small. I got a, I got a huge hot chocolate at Sheets. It was huge. That probably be a crime in New York City. Another hand somewhere else. Yes, sir. Earlier, uh, essay um, burning of judging and while leading it, um, it seems as if you are advocating that judges ought to be um, one of our most moral professions. Um, saying, for example, they need to temper themselves and restrain themselves when they ought to be restrained. Well, I've been courage and courage to be active when they need to be active. If I'm putting words in your mouth, please correct me right now. Finish your right. question. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm correct in saying that you're saying, asserting that judges need to be um, more and more moral professions, why do you think that in our world where moral professions are clamoring for the scarce moral people, why should judges get that instead of like teachers or policemen or something like that? Okay, well, I'll, I don't think you, I don't agree with everything you said, but I agree with parts of it. Let me, let me answer the question this way. Um, the role of a judge, and I think you might have read one of my articles on this. The role of a judge is um, uh, very difficult, uh, and it's not well defined. And there's this inherent tension, right? You guys just had an election a couple days ago. You had two people who had different perspectives on the law. One guy won, one guy lost, and it was pretty close. Um, but you had a vote, right? Every person in this county, or at least people at the age of 18 of this, this county could go vote, and they voted. Um, Judges don't have that sort of accountability, right? If Mr. S Mr. Lamb goes and does things you don't like, you can throw the bum out in the next election. If a federal judge issues rulings you don't like, too bad. He's in office the rest of his life. You can impeach a judge, but it almost never happens, usually for criminal conduct, right? Judges are usually not removed from office for merely issuing bad decisions. So there's this tension, right? You're in this judge, you're in this position, there's no accountability. So you can either say, you know what, because I am not accountable, I will simply defer to the democratic process. Whatever law Congress has passed, I'll say, yeah, that's fine, unless it's really blatantly bad. Or you can be the other side, you know what, I'm a judge, I'm a beacon of morality, and I'm going to decide the wisdom of every law that passes before me. And if I disagree with the 535 members of Congress and the president, then striking it down. Um, this is a never-ending tension, and we'll pretend to give you the answer to this question. You can read my article if you want. Uh, but what I would submit is that the um, reflexive restraint 
that rational basis review, rational basis review requires is not consistent with the judicial role. At a minimum, if the government wants to justify a conviction, a criminal conviction, they need to provide evidence of why this law exists. It doesn't be perfect evidence. It doesn't be persuasive evidence, but they have to give some reason why they need to throw this guy in jail for selling milk at eight cents a quart. Right? They can't simply say, you know, Your Honor, there's some dairy farmers who want to protect them. Okay, that, that, that's a reason, maybe. I don't think it's a good reason. Um, but what you can have is a law like you had in Louisiana. And they reference this in the paper. Louisiana regulated florists. To become a florist, you needed a government license. Now, again, what's a florist? They arrange flowers, right? And to get a license to arrange flowers, who has to approve of you? Other florists. So other florists can stop you from entering the profession. They want to basically limit their competition. It would be wonderful if you could do that, right? What was the reason why Louisiana regulated florists? They didn't have a reason. They made up something. They said, well, there might be infected dirt if you're not regulated. Right? They said you could have blood in the dirt and the flowers. I mean, that's a little chop of horror. I, I don't know what, what that means, infected dirt. I've been thinking of this for years. When you have a law and the only conceivable basis of the law is protecting an economic interest, that is not a rational law, right? Limiting the price of milk, telling bakers they can't work as many hours they want. I think the baker one, there are some actually public health interests there, right? If you're working a lot, maybe you're not paying attention, the, the bread's dirty. So I think Lockton was probably wrongly decided that Harlan had the better opinion. But in the Nebbia case, the milk's fine. Whether the milk's being sold for eight cents, nine cents, or four cents, it's the same damn milk. And it's just not a good basis for it other than protecting dairy farmers. With Caroline products, the milk is fine in the can, it's healthy, it's safe. You're only banning it to help other people. So when you have purely protectionist economic legislation, I don't think it's a rational basis to exist. If there's some other valid basis that actually reflects health and safety, I'll go along with it. Now, other people think I'm too liberal on this, that you know, you should have even, uh, you should have to know it's just any class legislation, if protectionism, it's never good. I don't go quite that far. But if it's only about protectionism, I'm okay with the court setting it aside and saying this conviction cannot proceed. Anything in the back? My, my people over there. Questions? Uh, yes, over here. Yeah, a few months ago, I visited a steel mill, and I remember the guy who owned it said that if they were able to sweep up enough jobs with a certain size of pile, the EPA could actually come in and try to shut down the steel mill. Now, I was going to ask you, if the state of Pennsylvania's environmental laws were you know, much less severe than the federal laws may be, what right then does the executive agency have to come through and to shut down Right, so the question is about the power of agencies to regulate local manufacture. Um, the Darby case I mentioned was a, an earlier one, which said, we can regulate the wages you're paying because ultimately those goods might be shipped to interstate commerce. So when you have a steel mill, right, when you have a steel mill, they're probably shipping goods across state lines, or if they're not, they're, they're taking inputs from across state lines. Once you have that connection to interstate commerce, Congress's power is complete. And when the federal government regulates something, Pennsylvania is displaced. So whatever standard the federal government sets, that's the floor. Right? Pennsylvania can't have less stringent regulation. They can go above it. Right? You can have state regulate federal and then state even higher. But the feds have that floor, and that's an important point. Uh, so under current law, I, I appreciate your, your steel mill owner's friend's question, but He's at the mercy of whatever the EPA or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, has to say, whatever they say goes. And the Pennsylvania uh, uh, inspectors can only just, you know, tag along. Other questions? Is that it? If there are no more questions, let us give up. Thank you so much. I know that as you were speaking, especially the economic students here, you were thinking about the supply and demand curves to, to match all of your legal arguments.
So we're, uh, we're very happy that you're able to come here from, from Texas, actually. Oh, I was in Cincinnati this afternoon. I'm all over the place. <laughs> and um, I wow, have look a, at that. a plaque to give to you that I hope you'll put next to you. It will be on my wall. It will be on my office. wall next week. In yes. recognition of Professor Josh Blackman, visiting Stover Constitutional Fellow in Constitutional Studies and Moral Leadership at Waynesburg University. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I'll thank do, you. I'll do the Trump thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if any of you would like to speak to Professor Please. Blackman some more, we can gather up here Please, afterward. Come, come. And then also tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. I, th I think I ran this by. At I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. At 8 a.m. in <laughs> Benenham, uh, he would be happy to discuss law school or any other graduate pursuits um, you know, if, if you meet us there. So thank you all for thank coming. So Have a good evening. And, uh, Onward and upward. So, thank you so much, Larry. <laughs> thank you. Terrific.